Thank you so much for having me. I um, really took to heart the other uh, after we heard that we were so kind of supposed to suspend our agenda and really trust this process. And I've really been struggling with the fact that I was put into scale and spread, because I really am skeptical. I'm skeptical about these conversations about scale and designing for scale. And part of it is because I want to give you an insight into my brain. This is how I think about learning. So orange is formal school when you're awake, and blue is all the time you're awake when you're not in school but still learning. So the idea that we're thinking about education and that it's really about school, I think, is not helpful. And it's not helpful for certain kinds of kids more than other kids. So for me, the punchline is school is important, but it's not sufficient. And that when we think about the endeavor of education and teaching and learning, um, it's most insufficient, school is most insufficient for our most vulnerable kids. So that's kind of the lever that I'm working at all the time and thinking about education. And science for me is a vehicle for working for justice. It's an arena. I want to put science into the service of kids. Um, so let's talk about impact for a second. Anybody know what this is a picture of or what it's a picture, what it's supposed to be a picture of? Who said, oh, WikiSeek guy, that's so awesome. Yes, <laughs> right. This is supposed to be the asteroid that hit the planet that killed the dinosaurs. And that's often how we think about impact. Like, it's something that happens and there's an impact. Except if we even dissect this impact a little bit, yes, the asteroid hit the planet 65 million years ago, give or take 11,000 years. And the dinosaurs went extinct after it crashed into the Earth give or take 33,000 years. And we know that asteroid hit the Earth, but we also know all these other things then happened. It got cold, clouds were in the air, plants died, animals didn't have things to eat, and that was part of it. But also there were certain parts of the Earth that were really already stressed. And in some cases, extinctions were already starting to happen. So what is the role of this asteroid hitting the Earth 65 million years ago, give or take 11,000 years? Impact is complicated, and impact happens in a dynamic environment, and it doesn't live in isolation. So, so when we think about scale, you know, I really, Lisa gave me this mandate, like, I really want you to push this idea of scale. And I was like, oh, Lisa, please don't put me in scale. And she's like, Gabe, I think that's really where you belong. Um, I, I just got to get it off my chest. I think scale is an enormous distraction. I think when you design for scale, it keeps you from being awake and mindful the way our first speaker asked us to be. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm an education activist. I work in science because it's a bastion of inequity. It's a magnifier on the inequities in school. And I can talk about that for a long time and would love to. but. I'm watching my clock, which they started early on me. Um, so yeah, I came to science. I studied medieval religious mysticism, the history of anthropology. I um, worked uh, for Teaching Tolerance, which is at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, I went to dig up dinosaurs in the Sahara and South America and China. And one of the most important experiences for me is that I worked for something called the Small Schools Workshop and have been really active part of the Small Schools Movement, which taught me some really, really important things that shaped a lot of the work that I do now. Um, so I would come back from these expeditions and this is what I found in the classroom. We just heard about it from, I can't remember his name, Wiki Seeds. You know, this is what school looks like for kids. Did this, how many people had a science class that looked like that? Right? Most of us. Or a history class? Or an English class? We're doing it right now. We're replicating this picture right now. Um, you're probably recording me on your iPhones just like that. OK. So, so here's the problem, though. The fundamental problem is that school almost always looks for this, looks like this for certain kinds of kids. It looks like this most of all for the kids that struggle most in school, with rare exceptions and with teacher exceptions all the time. Um, 
but, but I went into these schools on the south side of Chicago. I was teaching in schools. And I saw this over and over. And it really forced me to ask the question, whose job is it to kind of do meaningful things with science? You know, I was coming back from these expeditions and digging up dinosaurs. And kids had these fabulous questions. And like, whose job it is to turn these kids on? And the answer was kind of nobody. So you have very elite programs for kids that are academically accelerated. And you have museums that serve thousands of people and spark genius or whatever that is happening when the really good ones do it, but kind of nothing in between. And certainly nobody was watching out for my kids. So back in 1999, I co-founded this organization called Project Exploration. We had a very specific mission. We wanted to basically be a bridge between turned on scientists and kids who otherwise would never get involved with science. And you know, when we talk about minorities in science, I really want to encourage us to be looking at economics as well as academics, and not just whether or not they're African American or minority or girls, which is also an important way to think about this. Um, so, so when we started Project Exploration, I, I actually wanted to, to articulate the design parameters, because this is what I opened the door with. This was the things that I thought was important on the first day when we ran our first after school program called Sisters for Science, which was named that afternoon by the girls. Because these are still the design parameters, even though a lot of other things have changed. Um, students should be known, literally, their names. You should know them for what they're curious about, what they like to do, what they're interested in. And that learning is based on relationships. Relationships imply responsibility. It's a two-way street. Meaningful work matters. Actually, Larry, the other day, said that up here. And that students can and should co-create curriculum. That's what happened in WikiSeats. Those kids were co-creating the curriculum. The other thing is everything about our programs at Project Exploration begin with this question of what's worth knowing and experiencing. And I'll tell you, we almost never, ever, ever think that what's most worth knowing and experiencing is going to scale. It's just not at the heart of the matter when it comes to education. And I'm going to get to that again. Um, this is the question we ask kids to answer all the time. And because the relationships are a two-way street, we're constantly asking kids, what do you think? What should we do? What's most worthwhile? So I don't have time to talk about all of the different programs. So this is just like a little snapshot. We have junior paleontologists. Uh, they go out and dig up dinosaurs. We have all girls expedition. They go to Yellowstone and work with field conservation biologists. We do urban ecology. We do geology. We do forensics with the FBI. We create crime scenes. We do coding. We do a lot of engineering, more and more engineering. The students love engineering. It's opening a whole new world to us. Um, but our goals are the following. We want to get them interested in science. We want to keep them involved. And we want to equip them with the experiences that will let them choose to pursue science if they want to. But we're not trying to make scientists. Um, all of the students do structured reading and writing. They create projects. There's a showcase of knowledge. This is going across middle and high school students. Middle and high school students are mixed together. So. You know, we're always asking them, how's it going? What's working? What's not working? How should we change? We did a big study at five years. We did a big study at 10 years. And at 10 years, we reached out to UC Berkeley. And we said, hey, will you help us? We're now sitting on a lot of data. We've had more than 1,000 students come through our programs. And we need to kind of understand what's happening with them collectively. And that question, like what's going on, um, when we've asked that question ourselves, we've come up with some surprising facts. For example, um, at one point, we had kids together on a Saturday. And we said, what the heck? Uh, let's, let's ask them a couple of questions we haven't asked them before. And one of the questions we asked them was, where do you learn about college? You know, friends, family, your counselor at school, other. And we were horrified. <laughs> when we found that most of that, those surveys came back. And in the other line, they'd written project exploration. We were not, we're not a college prep program. But more importantly, we weren't being explicit or intentional in any way in thinking about what that, about where college fit into our conversation. We're you know, creating crime scenes and dissecting squid. Like, so, so all along the way, our design is influenced by the fact that we're focused right here at home with the kids and asking them what matters to them. 
Then we bring in UC Berkeley and we say, all right, so like what's happening with the kids? It was a very intensive process. And here are some of the things we found. We found that 95% of our students were graduating or on track to graduate. Reality check, anyone know what the graduation rate for Chicago public schools are? 49% uh, in five years. So this was exciting. 50% um, of our students were enrolled in a four-year college or had already graduated. Uh, one in five African-American males in Chicago graduates college on average in five years. It's a very different statistic. And 60% of our students had majored in STEM or were receiving a degree. So this is the impact that matters, right? This is the impact we're asked about all of the time. And in the world of science, everybody cares about the pipeline, the leaky pipeline. How do we keep kids from leaking out of the pipeline? How do we keep them on track? Enter in elementary school, go to school in middle school, choose the right college, high school courses, go to college, come out with your degree, go to work. Uh, the pipeline is the problem. The statistics I just read you, they're very important for our young people. But it's not what's most important, ultimately, for what we think we should be designing for. Those are a byproduct for us. And in fact, the idea of the pipeline is restricting us. Like, let's just break it down for a second. You all, who built prototypes? You had those materials. What is the material of a pipeline? It's like cold metal, it's PVC pipe. What goes through the pipeline? Sludge. Like, I don't want my students to be sludge. I don't want to be like PVC pipe, just pass through me and I have nothing to do with your, there's nothing about this metaphor I like, nothing. I'm a woman, I don't like plumbing metaphors. Like, I don't, I don't, and it's not helping me, right? It's not helping expand my vision of what's possible for my young people. So what do I think the most important lessons from that 10 year study? Um, I think that if you do high caliber out of school programs, it shifts what's possible for young people. The second thing is, our kids were becoming scientists and we weren't even trying to make them scientists. By the way, just as a reminder, science is like a magnifier on education, so we're not just talking about science right now. But here's the thing, what mattered to the kids? Because that's who we're designing for, right? That's who we care about. Here's what they care about. Somebody knows their name. This is a thousand students checked in surveys, interviews, every which way we tried to have like no bias in trying to get their answers. We had no idea these were the answers they were gonna say. Somebody knows their name. They learn how to write. You know, they bitch about writing every single time. Like, oh my God, Miss Gabe, are you making us journal again? Yes, we are. Yes, every day, every time you're with us, you're gonna write. And you know what? When they get through the other end of it, they're like, thank you so much for helping me write. I'm the only person in my class that can write. They're in the news for something good. And this is the one, again, we stopped and stared. The program never ends. We just weren't thinking about our program that way. So, so I think about this quote a lot. Um, one picture of a caterpillar does not tell you it's gonna transform into a butterfly, and it takes many frames of the cinema to inform you a butterfly can fly. Buckminster Fuller. You know, if we were just looking at short-term design or we were focused on scale, we wouldn't know that Edna Angelis was going to be a scientific illustrator, even though she's in the country as an undocumented immigrant, that Lauren would go into communications, that Kendra would become a nurse, that Alora would open up her own hair salon, that Justin would want to be a comedian, that Andres, who's in the lower, uh, lower corner there, would become one of a handful of masters in geologies who are Latinos. So here's the issue. How do you actually design for a program that never ends? What, what, what is that going to do for us? How does that change how we think about things? And I think this is, this is why, Miriam, it took me so long to get you the slides. I've been struggling with this. So I got them to her. She's been very patient. Um, so this is what I've been struggling with. You know, what would happen when we think about the purpose? Maybe we would move from competitiveness to thinking about opportunity and access and equity. Maybe the things we would measure would move from testing students to knowing students. Can you imagine if that's what we were having conversations about, knowing our students and what they needed? Um, and maybe from the metaphor standpoint, we could really have a lot of fun. If we thought about metaphors for individuals, pathways, passports, 
You know, that over the course of their K-12 education or their life from age 5 to 18, we wanted them to fill up their passport with lots of kinds of experiences and that that's what we were being vigilant about. What if we, now that we're in the world of data, what if what we actually paid attention to for a neighborhood or a city were patterns of participation? Personally, for me, I'm like super juiced about this idea. Um, also, that's just a picture from the stock market. That's not real data. As the, the scientist in me is like super nervous about putting fake data up there. So that just so you know, I think it's like the Chinese index. I don't know. OK, most, most interesting idea. Stop. OK, I'm going to just run my 30 seconds because you know they started me early. So punctuated equilibrium. All right, so for the science geeks in us, you know that the idea about evolution is like change through time. And everybody wants our students to be about gradual evolution. Walk down through your grades, evolve at the same pace, develop, get ready, graduate high school, go to college. But you know what? Kids' lives, the most vulnerable kids' lives, have moments where they're off the grid for a little while. Life intervenes. They have a kid. They're in the justice system. They move. All kinds of things happen. So our new world of metaphors, if we wanted to design with our students in mind, what if we thought about caterpillars and fireballs and ripples? Because that's what our students need. They need us to design for the long haul, because that's the impact they care about. Thank you.